the zombie genre of games, in my eyes, is definitely one of the more interesting genres out there today. It's such a vast and great genre, with a surprising amount of variety out there. Something about the undead has always been a theme that grabs my attention, whether it's a zombie infested mall or a holiday resort, to a creepy old mansion or a police station infested with infected citizens. The zombie concept can just be plopped into pretty much every type of game and it just seems to work. Obviously the more important side of things is the gameplay, but zombies make a good blend into a majority of different gameplay formats. There's games like Dead Rising, Dead Island and Dying Light, tackling in the open world sandbox providing the player an open world to let loose, explore and just fight their way through a never ending horde of the undead with whatever they can find. But if that's not your style you could always group up with a couple of friends and be thrown into different scenarios and stories with games like Left 4 Dead or World War Z, providing a linear but satisfying fight against the undead while you try to flee the streets and find a safe haven. And if you don't think that's scary enough, perhaps the original Resident Evil series or even the recent remake of Resident Evil 2 might tickle your fancy, as they all provide a spectacular take on the horror scene and it's thanks to them that the zombie genre started to form and become the genre we know and love today. Especially with the first couple of games because they blend the perfect mix of horror, action, puzzles and mystery into the games we know and love today. And if that's not enough, we've also got more arcade like zombie games with games like Plants vs Zombies providing a fun little challenge and then House of the Dead with on rail shooting mayhem, albeit with some grade A voice acting. This way's blocked. We gotta find another way out. Basically, the point I'm trying to make here is there are a lot of zombie games that have come out over the recent years and there's a lot that I've actually missed myself. But when it comes to recent games, one game I've been looking forward to for the last couple of years is a game called Days Gone and today I'm finally ready to talk about it. And yes, I know I have been a bit late with this one and a lot of people have already spoken about it but there's a reason as to why and that's because I wanted to get as much as I can out of the experience of Days Gone before I write something up. And now that I've finished it, I think I'm ready to talk about it. So let's dig in. When Days Gone was originally announced back in 2016, it got a fair bit of attention. It not only looked great, but had one major selling point that compared to a lot of previous zombie games wasn't really a common thing. The amount of zombies rendered on screen with a stable frame rate was quite unique and it was rather insane at the time. Which doesn't really sound all that impressive now, especially since we've got games like World War Z, but when you compare it to the competition Days Gone had behind it, it was a pretty niche gimmick. Before Days Gone, there was only one game series that really comes to mind that actually tries to attempt to push the total amount of zombies on the screen without the game shitting itself and that was Dead Rising. Dead Rising made this one of their main staples of the gameplay alongside the ability to being able to grab and use whatever you can find, but when it comes to the high zombie count, no other game really attempted this. Now that alone doesn't make all the other games out there bad, it was just an underwhelming thing to see that no studio ever attempted to push this boundary. So seeing Ben's studio attempt to increase the level of threat from a horde in a zombie game, you can imagine how quickly my interest for this game peaked. But obviously this wasn't enough to go by, I wanted to know a bit more about the game itself and tried to figure out what kind of game I was expecting without spoiling the story. So from what I gathered at first, Days Gone was going to be another open world game with a similar formula to games made by either Ubisoft or Rockstar. Basically it was an open world sandbox with a bunch of missions to do, items to loot and things to craft. Overall though you'd be progressing through an open world with a main story overseeing it all. It's definitely an interesting case as the core game itself isn't anything new. In fact you could argue that this game plays it incredibly safe with the mechanics it actually uses at the core. Days Gone is an open world story driven game in a similar style to games like Red Dead Redemption, a vast open world with some beautiful landscapes and various characters throughout the world giving the player various tasks and scenarios sending them from one place to another. And at a glance, yeah, you're definitely going to be right in thinking this. It's just another open world game falling into the pile of many other titles you've probably already played or titles that you have left on that never ending list of games you'll never play and you'll play later. And funnily enough, that's how this game feels at first. It starts off following suit like any other open world game, but within the first hour you'll soon realise that while the developers at Ben Studio didn't really attempt to throw any new gimmick into the game to try and make some new mechanics, they instead took the route of knowing what an open world feature should be and improve it. And surprisingly that worked really well. 
So to start things off, Days Gone follows you on the journey of Deacon St. John, an empty husk of a married man who lost his wife during the start of the outbreak. Two years have passed since then and Deacon's become a survivor just like everyone else. But instead of sticking to one camp and settling down like a lot of survivors have, Deacon and his best friend Boozer have ended up becoming drifters and more specifically guns for hire, being hired to track down people, take out bandit camps and overall getting the dirty work done. Obviously over time with more people knowing of their existence and their work, there's going to be those people out there who don't really appreciate what they do. And that falls into two different categories, the marauders who are basically just some random bandits attempting to kill you in your travels, but more importantly both Deacon and Boozer gain the attention of a local cult called the Rippers. And they're not the nicest people to know. At first you know them as a cult who just want to be more like the Freakers for some reason, but over time you'll learn that the aggression towards Deacon and Boozer has a bit more depth to it than anyone originally expected. Also yes, zombies in this game are known as Freakers, it's a minor detail for sure, but it makes their interpretation of the common infected stand out against the masses of zombie games. But if we're looking at a brief overlay of this game, you'll be surprised with the amount of plot twists and random encounters that not only expand the universe of Days Gone, allowing you to get more of an insight on how fucked up things have become, but also how the game follows Deacon through a never ending battle of loss, and worse, the consequences of the choices he makes. Some of the main parts of the game that you're going to face over and over throughout the game is doing bounties and jobs for local camps, traversing through the wildlands and finally the never ending onslaught of freakers, marauders and rippers. With all three of these beautifully combining together at points to make some amazing moments, especially when it comes to tackling the horde. With the variety of freakers being introduced throughout the game, you're obviously going to encounter more specials more frequently in the wild, but the hordes themselves are something different. At a certain point in the game, you'll actually get to a mission where the freakers tend to huddle up during the day and hibernate in caves, and come out during the night making the nights a little bit harder to travel in. But regardless of this, Deacon wants to tackle these hordes head on and tries to lessen the quantity of infected in the area. And what's weird about this is how this level is structured. You'd expect this to be tackled in a one-off mission, right? Like, get the equipment, watch a scripted scene take place, and then that's it. Right? Well, instead, this ends up becoming one of the various side missions you'll end up getting in this game, as you'll be given the option to deal with these hordes in your own time, as this splits into two categories. The first being cleaning out nests in specific areas, and the second being take down the hordes that are roaming the wildlands. The nests are more focused in areas like towns and old warehouses, where you'll find buildings and landmarks filled with these weirdly built nests, and your goal is just to burn them out. It's a basic objective and obviously leads to you taking out a few freakers here and there, but the other side mission is a lot more exciting, as after a certain point in the game you'll end up getting a bunch more missions which involve you finding these wandering hordes around the area and taking them out. At first you'll find a couple that seem rather small and think oh yeah I can get this done immediately, while in reality these hordes are going to kick your ass and kill you in a matter of seconds, as the hordes in this game are not only fast, they're massive and you're probably going to be overconfident and get yourself killed like I did over and over. And unlike a game like World War Z where the horde can just fuck you over for the sheer reason of you can't really move, the hordes in Days Gone fuck you over 9 times out of 10 because it's your own fault and I think that's brilliant. Normally hordes in games don't really do that much to get me excited, but I had myself at the edge of my seat countless times when tackling a horde bigger than I can handle. It's honestly amazing to see that this game doesn't struggle to render and process so many freakers on screen at one time, but somehow it does it and it does it incredibly well. My only bit of advice is don't try to tackle one immediately because you most likely won't have the equipment suitable for taking them on. If you want better equipment however, you'll need to build up trust with specific camps in order to do so. Being a drifter, Deacon is known for travelling through three different camps in the area, doing various jobs for them alongside some other side objectives to help build trust. Upon gaining trust of a camp, you'll gain access to various benefits from said camp, whether that's new equipment like weapons, some more items to buy like health kits, silencers and throwables, and finally, some new parts for your bike. Now, you don't get these bits and pieces for free obviously, if you want them you're going to have to work for it, as you need to earn credits in that specific camp as credits can't be traded from one camp to another. But not only that, each camp will have three different tiers and with the camp requiring a certain threshold of trust to be met before you can unlock the next tier, and obviously with each tier you'll unlock more equipment that can be used to be purchased in said camp. Thankfully, unlike a lot of survival games, you won't really need to focus on eating or drinking every 5 minutes. As let's be fair, while it's a neat mechanic, it's really bloody annoying, but you can still scavenge for food as food can actually be used to trade in the camp for credits and trust alongside any bounties you happen to pick up after killing infected along the way, which definitely makes the satisfaction of wiping out a horde so much better. Now obviously if that alone was the only way to gain trust in a camp, I'd immediately write about how much I hate it, but thankfully playing through this game on its own is its own reward 
and helps towards gaining trust to the camp, as both mandatory and secondary missions gain trust to specific camps as all the camps in the area are involved with the main story. In Days Gone, the game has a structure set up for all the missions called storylines, as the name states these split the variety of missions you'll encounter into game specific categories, normally narrowing down the type of mission, but in the long run it'll actually fit into a part of one of the many stories that Days Gone offers throughout the playthrough. And that's something that honestly took me by surprise with this game. Instead of just being a game with this one main plot through the entirety of it, the game actually has a few big stories with a lot of smaller stories wrapped around each other with threads passing through at each point. For example, the damage of Boozer's arm at the beginning of the game will lead you towards Deacon battling his memories of trying to move on, whilst also helping to bridge the agreement with a former camp that you used to help as they provide work and treatment for Boozer, instead of him just being hidden away in a radio tower for the rest of the game. The story itself is written in such a way that not only really expands the backstory and lore of this game, it actually makes sense to progress through it. Nothing major is left unexplained and any minor details that you'd expect to be missed like plot holes or just backstory in general can either be obtained via the flashbacks Deacon has to his time with Sarah or via the many collectibles you'll find scattered around the world of Days Gone. When playing through the storylines in this game, I originally considered them just a basic mission tracker with a new name, but in the long run, I didn't even realise that these have meaning once you get further into the game. For example, there's stories that focus on the nearer outposts, which you'd think at first are just the common Ubisoft trope of stations to secure to unlock boosts for your character, but in fact there's items on this site that actually give a bit of backstory into the outbreak, and with the completion of this storyline, it leads on to bigger things. As for what that bigger thing is, well, you'll have to find out yourself. There's some things even I won't spoil. So moving on slightly, upon clearing out a Nero site, you'll get an injector that allows you to improve a specific stat of Deacon, being either health, stamina or weapon focus. Weapon focus is basically just an in-game slowdown to help with aiming. It's definitely a useful feature when the game gets a bit more intense, but most of the times I just forgot it was a thing. Now, that's not the only way you can level up Deacon, as there is another way as well, which is the skill point system. Skill points are gained by just leveling up, and these skills, however, will give Deacon various little perks and attributes, like being quieter while sneaking, or being able to take down larger enemies during a quick time event. Initially, when I figured out what these skill points did, I immediately jumped to the conclusion that they'd have the same end result as games like Dead Rising Dead Island, taking the main character from a player who struggles to tackle a single infected to a character who's just a walking god that can destroy whatever in their way. And to my surprise, most of these skills are actually balanced really well, giving you a slight buff to make things a little bit easier, but not enough to hold your hand throughout the rest of the game. I say most of these skills however, as the sneak skill makes the stealth sections in this game an absolute joke. At first, when I encountered the stealth missions, I was honestly quite surprised as these missions were rather challenging and a welcome change of pace to the game's overall style. And best of all, the stealth system in this game actually works really well, and doesn't feel like a half assed mechanic. I mean, this game even has items made specifically for the idea of making distractions to either open up a new path or just take out a larger group of enemies all at once. Now, having a silent movement doesn't completely negate the challenges of stealth, with the AI walk patterns in the field of view always being taken into consideration, but it is entirely possible to have a specific event feel like a cakewalk. I think the skill itself should have been a bit more specific on what kind of surfaces the sound would negate on, as in days gone when it's heavily raining, you're pretty silent anyway due to the overall sound, while when it's snowing you should be louder due to the crunch of your footprint in the snow. Yes, Days Gone actually has a working weather system in this game and it's done insanely well. It's not like most games where the weather is locked to a specific point in the game, but rather it just happens naturally. One day you could be driving your bike down a dirt track while the next day you could be in a shootout in a snow filled parking lot. Personally, I don't really count graphics as a selling point to a game, as a lot of indie games and also AAA titles don't really have the nicest graphics, but are actually a really good game, and it really depends on the style of game you're playing. But I can't help but admit I was in awe at points in this game, especially when traversing the dirt roads on my bike. It honestly felt quite relaxing most of the time. Unless I was chasing someone, then it just felt rather intense. However, these feelings aren't just provided thanks to the landscape. Having a vehicle in this game that doesn't drive like complete arse, yes, looking at you, Dead Island, is an absolute treat, and with days gone, your motorbike is basically the equivalent to a man's best friend. You will spend a bunch of credits and time maintaining your bike, repairing it with spare parts, or attempting to find fuel to keep the motor running. Due to losing your bike at the start of the game, you will start with the worst fuel tank ever, but it doesn't take long for things to improve, and you'll see yourself enjoying the ride and finding it more of a surprise that you need to refuel again, rather than thinking, fuck, I've gotta go and stop for gas again. 
Now obviously with this being an open world game you don't actually have to travel everywhere although I suggest you do because there's a lot you're going to miss out if you don't. One of the big things with this game as well is the random encounters you're going to find throughout Days Gone and these can range from little things to people trying to stop you on your bike just to kill you and take parts or sometimes you might find a survivor who's about to be executed and you have the chance to save them. Upon saving them you can actually send them to one of the free camps and actually get rewards for it. And if you were just to fast travel everywhere you'd miss a lot of this stuff going on. So thankfully one of the things in this game is that you've actually got a restriction to how the fast travel system works. Depending on that fuel tank you've got you can only travel so far because while you fast travel you are actually going to use up fuel so you might want to keep that in consideration. Plus that feeling of having to get off your bike and fight a couple of people who are trying to kill you, something about it is just really fun and rewarding, especially when the gunplay comes into it because the guns in this game feel absolutely amazing. It's very rare for me to actually take my time and sit down and play for an open world game because when you look at things like The Division, it's not that interesting after a while and you kind of just get dragged back and forward. But whenever there was something in Days Gone, I actually sat there and thought, maybe this is worth my time and I've not really experienced that in another game before. You know it's really surprising but games like Assassin's Creed and Red Dead Redemption don't really appeal to me that much yet somehow Days Gone managed to keep me interested the entire time and I just couldn't stop playing it. Now that's not to say this game is perfect as there is definitely some hiccups here and there and overall it doesn't really negate from the enjoyment of the game but there's obviously room for improvement. Honestly, I didn't have a lot of problems with Days Gone, but the biggest thing I did notice that did throw me off at points was the pacing of the story. Don't get me wrong, Days Gone's overall plot is brilliant, it's interesting, it's entertaining, and obviously whoever wrote it had a lot of passion behind it. But at some point from the conversion of adding it into the game, the plot just seems to slow down and speed up when it likes. Take for example the issue with Boozer at the start of the game. He gets his arm badly burnt and after a while it takes ages for him to get to a point where he needs medical attention. But at another point in the game, you'll find a child alone on her own and take her to a camp for safety for the very next mission for her to run away because she was mistreated. Like, in the story, that was probably over the span of a week to a month. For me in the game, I just dropped her off there and immediately went into the next mission and then she did a runner. There are definitely more issues like this throughout the game, but I can't really delve into them as they're major spoilers. And for anybody who actually wants to play this game, I don't want to spoil it for them. But when you get to that point in the game which I'm thinking of, you will immediately notice it. Other than that, the only real problems I had were the occasional bug and then the frame rate issues. Towards the second half of the game, the game would just randomly start to slow down and chug. I'm not really sure what caused it, but it wasn't the freakers. Whenever a horde is in the game, the game runs at a stable pace. But when I was in the southern part of the map, the game just struggled and there wasn't even anything there. Besides that, I encountered two game-breaking bugs. One breaking a side mission's progression and another being a missing floor. Not an ideal bug, but the second one was resolved by simply rebooting the game. The bug mission, however, took over a month to fix. Now I have heard and read on the subreddit that a lot of players were having various other issues, but I had either missed them or by the time I got to them the devs had managed to patch it out. Which is a great sign as the developers really care about this game, which is something I rarely see in video games these days. Now overall, Days Gone isn't going to be a game that breaks the current boundaries of modern day gaming. But Days Gone shows the passion and love from the people at Ben Studio and from playing it for over 60 hours and getting every single achievement and 100% in the game, causing a partial delay in this review mind you, then I say it'd be absolutely worth it. We've had a lot of zombie games over the years and in a lot of different ways they've all tried to fill a niche that someone requires. And a lot of the zombie games that I've played to this day which I do love haven't really been the zombie game that I've wanted. Now Days Gone however is something I've been wanting for a while and it's done incredibly well. So yes, while it might not be anything different to games like Far Cry, Red Dead Redemption or any other open world game, Days Gone has taken the zombie formula to an open world sandbox game and made it brilliant. I can't say much more than that but if you've ever been curious about this game then I definitely suggest you pick it up. And at the end of the day, a game doesn't have to be outstanding and new to really be fun and rewarding. A game has to be enjoyable, and I think that's something this game does very well. It doesn't have anything amazing to point out, it doesn't have any unique features, but unlike a lot of open world games these days, you will enjoy every second of it. And I think that's what counts the most. <sighs> that was a long one for me. <laughs> Normally I would go through a game and just complete it and that's it, I will just get on with the next thing but with days gone I took my time and actually wanted to experience everything and I ended up getting to a point where I actually 100% of the game and you know got the most out of it and it was over 60 hours of my time and I don't regret any of that it's been an absolute blast to play it. and I think if you see days gone and you think you're curious about playing it 
then pick it up. It's, it's definitely worth the time. And after doing everything, so after all the 60 hours and getting every single achievement and every single collectible and killing every horde, I think it was worth it and I've had my fill. I think that's an amazing thing for a game these days. Well, I don't know about you, but whatever i got planned next is cancelled. I'll see you in a month. That is a joke, by the way. I've got something planned.